Well, good morning. I want to invite you, if you will, to open in your Old Testament to the book of Malachi. The book of Malachi chapter 1 is where we will begin our study this morning. As you're turning there, I want to tell you something I came across. It was the best-selling author. His name is Jack Canfield. He, uh, I'll be honest with you, I've never read the books, but if you've ever seen like the Chicken Soup for the Soul books or stuff like that, I think he was the, the writer of those. And he does a lot of seminars. People come and take seminars from him. And when they do that, he said that he asks the participants to agree to a list of 15 ground rules. I don't know what those are, but 15 things he asks them to agree to. In fact, he makes them, them sign a, a form in their workbook that they will abide by these 15 different rules. He said on the, third, on the morning of the third day, he asks everyone who has broken one of these ground rules to stand up. And he said, what becomes apparent is how casually we give our word and then how casually we break it. Almost everybody stands up. We have a tendency as human beings to make commitments that we ultimately don't fulfill. We, we begin things that we find difficulty carrying through to completion. And, and unfortunately, for some people, one of those things that they fail to carry through with is their service to God. And they may not quit altogether, but they quit giving God their best at some point. And so if you were to ask them, yes, they would still claim to be servants of God. There's no question about that but it's not really faithful service to God that they're giving. And so for every person who completely just you know, walks away from the Lord during the course of a year, I wonder how many people just become complacent. How many people just become apathetic about their service to God? And so they may still go through the motions, but there's no real devotion there. There's no true commitment there. And what we're going to find is that the same was true of the people in Malachi's day. So I want us to begin reading in, in Malachi chapter 1, in verse 6. It says, A son honors his father, and a servant his master. And then God says, if, I, if then I am a father, where is my honor? And if I am a master, where is my fear, says the Lord of hosts, to you, O priests, who despise my name? But you say, how have we despised your name? By offering polluted food upon my altar. But you say, how have we polluted you? by saying that the Lord's table may be despised. When you offer blind animals and sacrifice, is that not evil? And when you offer those that are lame or sick, is that not evil? Present that to your governor. Will he accept you or show you favor, says the Lord of hosts? And now entreat the favor of God that he may be gracious to us. With such a gift from your hand, will he show favor to any of you, says the Lord of hosts? Oh, that there were one among you who would shut the doors, that you might not kindle fire on my altar in vain. Have no pleasure in you, says the Lord of hosts, and I will not accept an offering from your hand. For from the rising of the sun to its setting, my name will be great among the nations, and in every place incense will be offered to my name, and a pure offering. For my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. But you profane it when you say that the Lord's table is polluted. And its fruit, that is, its food, may be despised. But you say, what a weariness this is. And you snort at it, says the Lord of hosts. You bring what has been taken by violence or is lame or sick. And this you bring as your offering. Shall I accept that from your hand, says the Lord? Cursed be the cheat who has a male in his flock and vows it, and yet sacrifices to the Lord what is blemished. For I am a great king, says the Lord of hosts. And my name will be feared among the nations." And now, O priest, this command is for you. If you will not listen, if you will not take to heart to give, to, honor, uh, to give honor to my name, says the Lord of hosts, then I will send the curse upon you, and I will curse your blessings. Indeed, I have already cursed them, because you do not lay it to heart. Behold, I will rebuke your offspring and spread refuse on your faces, the refuse of your offerings, and you shall be taken away with it. So shall you know that I have sent this command to you, that my covenant with Levi may stand, says the Lord of hosts. My covenant with him was one of life and peace, and I gave them to him. It was a covenant of fear, and he feared me. He stood in awe of my name. True instruction was in his mouth, and no wrong was found on his lips. He walked with me in peace and uprightness, and he turned many from iniquity. 
For the lips of a priest should guard knowledge, and people should seek instruction from his mouth. For he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. But you have turned aside from the way. You have caused many to stumble by your instruction. You have corrupted the covenant of Levi, says the Lord of hosts. And so I make you despised and abased before all the people, inasmuch as you do not keep the ways, but show partiality in your instruction. Those are not exactly easy words to read, are they? But there is a, a major premise that underlines really all that is said in this passage. And it's found in chapter 1 and verse 14, where the Lord would say of himself, I am a great king. And I want you to keep those words in mind as we go through our study this morning. The, the people of Malachi's day, they were assembling, they were gathering together, they were engaging in acts of worship. All of that was, you know, was going on in the days of Malachi. They hadn't stopped, but they weren't giving God the kind of honor that he deserved as a great king. And so they needed to learn the significance of these words that you find in chapter 1 and verse 6. A son honors his father and a servant his master. Honor to whom honor is due. And the Lord wasn't being honored by his people in Malachi's day. And it's not that the people of Israel didn't recognize the need to give honor to whom honor was due. They understood that principle. But they, they failed to give honor to the one who was worthiest of all. And the sad thing about all of this, when you read through what is said, it becomes clear that, that they were not even aware that they had lost their respect for God. They didn't even recognize that. Hebrew word for honor, it's a word that carries the idea of, of giving weight to something. It's something that is weighty. And the people of Israel were doing just the opposite of that. They were taking God lightly. And they denied that. They would have, they would have you know, all along the way, they, they keep saying, how are we doing this? What do you mean by that? And yet that's precisely what they were doing. They were taking God lightly. And as a result of that, they were taking everything that was associated with God lightly. And the question I want to ask this morning is, are we ever guilty of doing the same thing? You know, the first thing I want us to, to do in our lesson this morning is just notice several things that are mentioned in our passage that God brings up that, that bring dishonor to him, that fail to honor him in the way he deserves. And the first thing that I want us to see along those lines is that God is not honored by, by second-rate offerings. The people of Malachi's day were offering animals as sacrifice to God that were, they were sick or they were lame or they were blind. And not only did that go directly against what was commanded in the law of Moses, but I'll just tell you, God says it really kind of goes against common sense as well. He says you wouldn't offer an animal like that to your governor. You would treat him with honor. You would give him the best that you had. And I suspect that deep down they knew better than to offer something like that to God. But their hearts weren't right. There's one principle that comes through in Scripture. It's that God has always expected the very best a person has to give. He'll accept nothing less than that. He wants people to offer to him what, what comes from the top rather than the leftovers that are at the bottom. And, and the Scriptures tell us that time and time again, don't they? Jesus, for example, would say in Matthew 6 and verse, thir and verse 33 that we are to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That's priority one, Jesus says. And the reason God has always expected the best that a person has to give is because he knows that second-rate offerings are never the result of first-rate devotion. I'm going to say that again. Second-rate offerings are never the result of first-rate devotion. And so when people offer second-rate offerings, it is a sign that, that something else is being, is being placed ahead of God. And so I want to ask you this morning, do we, do we bring the very best that we have to God? It doesn't really matter what, what aspect of our service to him we may talk about. We ought to give him the very best that we have to offer. Because Malachi tells us, or the Lord tells us through Malachi, that, that he is not honored with leftovers. But there's a second principle we see here, and that is that God is not honored by half-hearted worship. See, the priests were acting like service in the temple was something that was tedious. It was a tedious obligation, not an awesome responsibility or awesome privilege they were engaged in. In fact, it seems to me that they were complaining about everything. Didn't you get that impression from what we read? The food came, their food came from the animals that were offered, and they were saying, this food is contemptible. And concerning their, their daily obligations as priests to, to offer those sacrifices, they were saying, this, basically, this is wearing me out. I, I'm getting tired of this. It's all a burden to them. 
And they were still going through the motions of worship. They were still doing these things. They were still offering the, the sacrifices. But they were doing so with the kind of have-to attitude rather than a want-to. One that recognizes God for who he is and is, is keen on giving him the best. You know, there's a passage in the book of Micah. Micah chapter 6 and verse 3 where the, where the Lord had asked his people a different time, a different situation to some degree, but the same old problem. And he says to his people there in Micah chapter 6 and verse 3, Oh, my people, what have I done to you? How have I wearied you? And, of course, the Lord had done nothing to weary them. The, the problem with the people in Micah's day is that they had the wrong attitude. We see the same thing in, in Malachi's day as well. I find it interesting that the Lord primarily addresses the priests in this section that we read. These men were in charge of the worship services. They not only offered the sacrifices, but they instructed the people as well. And so it's no wonder that the people were in the condition they were in Malachi's day. The men who were teaching them, the men who were offering the sacrifices on their behalf were, were part of the problem instead of being part of the solution. And so the Lord had given them the great honor of standing before the people to instruct them and to help them with their worship. But they were acting like this was a tremendous burden for them to take part in. And it shouldn't be surprising then that the people followed their example, followed the example of the priests. I think passages like the one that we're looking at ought to make us take a good look at ourselves and say, who are we? Did we ever act like, God, like serving God is a, a tremendous burden? You know, that we were just, you know, it's kind of been forced upon us. We have to do this. Are we ever guilty of offering God half-hearted worship because of that? Because our attitude is not right. We need to recognize that God would rather receive no worship at all than to receive that kind of half-hearted worship. When he says there in chapter 1 and verse 10, Oh, that there were one among you who would shut the doors that you might not kindle fire on my altar in vain. He's saying, you know what? I'd rather you not do this at all. If that's what you're going to do. If this is how you're going to go about it. Just, just don't do it. Just close the doors. He says, I have no pleasure in you, says, says the Lord of hosts, and I, I will not accept an offering from your hand. So many people think that you know, whatever we bring to God, he's just bound to be thankful we do it, and that's just not the case. He says, if that's how you're going to worship me, just stop doing it. I'm not going to accept it. And I'll tell you, that ought to make us think. How often do we, how often do we measure spiritual success in terms of, of how frequently the doors are open? When we come in, we, we were here, we did something. But if you look at what the, what the Lord said here, you have to come to terms with the fact that there are times when he would rather just have churches close their doors. If they're going to worship him half-heartedly, just, just shut the doors. So we need to see that worship and service to God, we need to see that as a great privilege that we enjoy rather than as a great burden we have to bear. God is not honored by half-hearted worship. And then third, I want you to see that God is not honored by watered-down teaching. The Lord says there in chapter 2 and verse 7, the lips of a priest should guard knowledge and people should seek instruction from his mouth for he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. But the priests in Malachi's day, they weren't doing that. They didn't serve in that capacity. As I said earlier, they were part of the problem, not of the solution. And their teaching had caused Israel to stumble. And if you want to know why the people were bringing animals that were sick and, and, and lame, I'm going to get all those three words right eventually. Give me a minute. Sick and lame and blind... It's because they knew that the priests were going to accept those. And so the law of Moses had said in Deuteronomy 17 and verse 1, you shall, not, you shall not sacrifice to the Lord your God an ox or a sheep in which is a blemish, any defect whatsoever, for that is an abomination to the Lord your God. No defects at all. But the priests had apparently watered down the standards that God had set for his people. And as a result of that, the people were offering sacrifices that were in keeping with the instruction they received. You're going, to you're going to take that? Fine, we'll bring it. And you know what? I think there's always a temptation for those who preach and those who teach to, to water down what God has said in his word. Preachers and teachers want to be liked. Believe it or not, most of them do not want to create trouble or cause turmoil or anything like that. But there are things that have to be said that make people uncomfortable sometimes. And, and the temptation, the great temptation is to just water down those things so that, they are, so that people will be more pleased with them. Yeah, I think that those of us who preach or those of us who teach, we need to ask ourselves questions at times. Whom are we trying to please? 
Who, whose opinion of our work is most important to us today? Are, are we just trying to, to make it to the back and have everybody say, that was a great lesson? Is that the goal? Shouldn't be. Paul said in 2 Timothy 4 and verse 3, the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. And I'll tell you one thing that's implied in that statement is that there will be teachers who are willing to accommodate such people. They'll give them what they want. But God is not honored when we water down his word. And so despite the fact that there were those who dishonored God in the days of Malachi, just as there's some who dishonor him today in very much the same ways, a different covenant, same principle, what we need to understand is that God is worthy of honor. And the people of Malachi's day may not have been serving God faithfully. They may not have been giving him the kind of honor he deserves. But I want you to notice what God said to them. When you get down to chapter 1 and verse 11, he says, For from the rising of the sun to its setting, my name will be great among the nations, and in every place incense will be offered to my name, and a pure offering, for my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. God deserves to be honored. And what he was telling the people of Malachi's days is that it was going to be honored. And when he said that, I think he was looking down through, the, down through the, the centuries. He was looking toward the future, at least from the point in time when Malachi wrote those words. And although he was primarily talking about the future, he, he did point out that there had been a time when his name was honored in the way that it deserved. In fact, in chapter 2 and verse 5, he spoke of Levi and he said of him, My covenant was with him, a covenant of life and peace, and I gave them to him. This called for reverence, and he revered me, and he stood in awe of my name. That's how one translation puts that. In other words, there was a time when the practice of the priests matched their calling. And the Lord didn't forget that. And what the Lord was telling the people in Malachi's day is that there would come a time when some would be zealous for God's honor once again. In that verse in chapter 1 and verse 11, when he says, From the rising of the sun to its setting, my name will be great among the nations. Did you notice at the time that he didn't say, You know what, my name's going to be great in Israel once again? He said it was going to be great among the nations. At that time, worship would no longer be attached to the temple. But he says there that in every place, pure offerings will be brought to my name. And I think what he's talking about there is the age in which we live. He's talking there about the church. And it seems to me that he was at least in part referring to the same thing Jesus was talking about when he met with the woman at the well in Samaria in John chapter 4. And he said to her in verse 21, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know. For salvation is from the Jews but the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. That's who we are supposed to be, isn't it? The Apostle Peter would say in 1 Peter 2 and verse 9 of Christians, you are a a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Again, that's who we are to be. And so God raised up a new priesthood to replace the one that had become bored with him. But I want to ask you a question. Are we living up to our calling? It may be that we need to listen to the appeal made by the Lord to the priests in Malachi's day. He appealed to them to, to take to heart, to give honor to his name. They hadn't taken that to heart. And so when you look there at Malachi chapter 2 in the very first couple of verses, he says to them there, And now, O priest, this command is for you. If you will not listen, if you will not take it to heart to give honor to my name, says the Lord of hosts then I will send the curse upon you, and I'll curse your blessings, he says. We serve a God who is worthy of honor, and that, that's something that we as his people must take to heart. One thing I think that's at least implied in those words is that honoring God is something that is a deliberate choice. When we talk about taking something to heart, it means we, we in, at least in part, we, we choose to do it. 
We make that choice. And we need to recognize that it's, this is not something that just kind of occurs naturally. In fact, if the history of God's people tells us anything, it's that there is a constant danger of us slipping into complacency and slipping into indifference. And we see that same pattern repeated time and time again in the Scriptures. And we see that same pattern repeated time and time again in the lives of God's people today. Make the choice to honor God. That's what it is. It's not, do I feel like, you know, is this working? I want it to be. No, it's what we give that is under consideration. The choice that we make to do that. And the way we honor God is, is again, by giving Him our best. You know, Jesus in Mark chapter 12 and verse 30 talked about the fact that you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. And whatever else we might say about these things, one, you know, one thing is clear about that. God expects us to give everything we have to give in service to him, to, to hold nothing back. And the point is that we are to love God with all that we are and all that we have. That's what Jesus was saying. And in practical terms, what that means is that we give our best in every area. That we don't just you know, hold off in one, maybe excel in another. And so let me ask you, have you been giving him your best? I mean, just an honest, as honest as you can, evaluation of your life. Have you been giving him your best? Only you know the answer to that question. You and God, that is. Now, I can go ahead and tell you, I assure you that I haven't been speaking this morning as someone who, who never struggles with the things we're talking about. I suspect we all do. We struggle with giving God our best at times. But the point of the lesson this morning is this, that our best is not only what God deserves, it's what he wants. And more than that, it's what he expects. He's told us that really nothing else will do. He is a great king, and his name will be honored among the nations because he is worthy. And so if you haven't been giving God the honor he deserves, then I hope this lesson's helped you in some ways to recognize the need to do that and hopefully to, to have the desire to do that. I hope it's made you want to do better. If you're here this morning and there's something you owe to him, we can help you with. Maybe, maybe we have someone here who has never obeyed the gospel of Christ. And I want to tell you what, God wants that for you. He wants to give you every spiritual blessing in Christ, but that's where they are found, in Christ. So if you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, then turn from your sins and confess the name of Jesus, that he is Lord, and then be buried with them in baptism, raised to walk in a new kind of life, one that will honor him. And if we can help you this morning with that or with some other duty you owe to him, we ask you to come as we stand and sing. Amen.